As you live, you breathe. And you need oxygen to live. Interference with either of the vital functions of breathing or circulation can deprive the tissues of oxygen and create a condition called asphyxia, which is potentially fatal. If it is starved of oxygen, it only takes about three minutes for the brain to die. The oxygen, essential for life, is in the air we breathe, but it contains far more oxygen than we can actually make use of. In fact, we breathe out enough to satisfy the needs of someone who isn't breathing at all. Our used air breathed into his lungs can keep him alive. Used air is useful. From now on, I shall describe the process of using your unused oxygen to breathe for someone else as artificial ventilation. But believe me, there's nothing artificial about it. It's very real. It's simply breathing for others. When we breathe into someone to make their blood circulate oxygen to the tissues, the whole process is called resuscitation. In breathing, oxygen in the air is absorbed and circulated by the blood. Then, air containing unused oxygen is breathed out. But the two processes of breathing and circulation are interdependent. So, when one stops, the other will also stop. When we breathe in air, we use our chest muscles to pull up the ribs, which expands the lungs upwards and outwards. The diaphragm, which is just below the lungs, flattens, increasing the capacity of the lungs downwards. There's a part of the brain that's a control centre that sends out signals which controls the rate and depth of breathing. The brain is particularly susceptible to lack of oxygen. If the heart isn't functioning properly, then it isn't pumping blood. If it isn't pumping blood, then the brain isn't receiving oxygen. If resuscitation is needed, then it is needed instantly. That means breathing for the casualty. It may also mean circulating his blood for him. Normally, fresh oxygenated blood is forced out of the pumping chambers at the left side of the heart 60 to 80 times a minute. When the breathing rate increases, the heart rate will increase correspondingly to provide more oxygen to the body. Having done so, the blood comes back into the right side of the heart to be reoxygenated, so that there is no mixing of used and freshly oxygenated blood. This is a one-way system controlled by valves in the heart itself, a perfect mechanism, providing it's working properly. But there are many reasons why it may not be working properly, or indeed, why it may not be working at all. In normal circumstances, air is taken in through the mouth and nose. It passes through an air passage over the back of the tongue and into the lungs. In cases of asphyxia, not enough air may be getting through because the passage of air is obstructed for some reason. It could be because of suffocation or strangling. The lungs or the ribs may be damaged through injury. In the cases of heart attack or electrocution, the circulation may be affected. The brain itself may become impaired through illness or drugs. In an unconscious casualty, the tongue may have fallen into the back of the throat, blocking the passage of air. If circulating blood becomes low in oxygen, for whatever reason, the effect is clearly visible. The skin becomes bluish, particularly at the lips and the lobes of the ears. This is a very positive danger signal requiring instant attention. In dealing with asphyxia, there are three components involved. The airway for the passage of air, the physical process of breathing, and the pumping action of the heart which circulates oxygen. A, B, C. 
the key letters. Getting and keeping an open airway is the absolute first priority. Even with a clear airway, you need to know if the casualty is breathing. Circulation is the heart beating to provide circulation of the blood carrying the oxygen. A, B, C. None of these vital functions can be considered on their own. Resuscitation may involve all three. They're dealt with in this order. First, keeping an open airway. Normal breathing is quiet. If you put your ear to the casualty's face, you may hear and should feel the air. This will tell you that the airway is open. Look along the line of the chest for rise and fall. In an unconscious casualty, noisy breathing is obstructed breathing. If the breathing is still obstructed, though not by the tongue, turn the head to one side and sweep out any foreign matter. Check that the breathing is satisfactory. Lift the chin to lift the tongue from the air passage. This maintains the airway open. This is the position called the recovery position for an unconscious casualty who is breathing and has a heartbeat. This position maintains the open airway and allows drainage of saliva. Many a life can be saved by the simple expedient of maintaining an open airway and placing a casualty into this position to safeguard breathing. But what if you've cleared the airway and still the casualty isn't breathing? Now is the time to give him some of your unwanted air which he badly needs. Breathe for the casualty. Give artificial ventilation. Place the head into the open airway position. Pinch the casualty's nostrils using your forefinger and thumb. This will ensure that any air that you give will not escape through the nostrils. Take a deep breath. Then seal your mouth over the casualties and breathe into the lungs four times in quick succession like this. If the rib cage hasn't moved, Readjust the head and try again. However, normal breathing may have begun, in which case we'll have placed the casualty into the recovery position. If, however, breathing still hasn't begun, then we check for circulation, and we do that by finding the pulse. The pulse, which will tell you whether there is a heartbeat or not, is at this position, in the hollow between the voice box and the muscle next to it. If you feel this pulse, then continue to ventilate to maintain the casualty's normal life functions. Carry on giving breaths at your normal breathing rate, 16 to 18 breaths a minute, until breathing restarts. This can happen at any moment. If there is no pulse, then further breaths can achieve nothing. 